um, Homer did not put the Odyssey together so that everybody would do a vocab quiz afterwards. Uh, he put the Odyssey together so that we could sit around a fire and listen to it and then talk about it. That's what we should be doing with books. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I'm back today with Adam Andrews from Center for Lit. Okay, can I just tell you, that is the most confusing name. With that. You've lived with it your whole life. Cause I, I want to naturally say Andrew, but I know it's not Andrew, I know it's Adam. And do you, people call you Andrew all the time? Yes. I would imagine. It's okay, I answer. <laughs> Yeah, and you have a lot of Andrew friends. I know Andrew Kudua, Andrew Kern. Like, there's there's lots of Andrews in the homeschool world. So I have to like consciously think it's Adam Andrews, not Andrew. Anyway, we are back with Adam Andrews from Center for Lit and having a great conversation about literature. Um, this has been so encouraging, and and I love having very practical ways to teach literature to our kids. Um, it is one of the most important parts of homeschooling. From those who are itty bitty to those who are graduating. If you, you know, we often tell people these new moms come into homeschooling and they're like, I have a four-year-old, what curriculum do I get? And we're like, none, just get some really good books and read books to your kids and mm -hmm. let them play outside a lot and play games with them a lot. That's what you need. But as they grow, of course, they get more introduced to more good literature. And, and that's our job as their homeschool moms. And it's so much fun. I love it. The relationships that we can build with our kids by reading to them and with them. Um, I still do that with my girls. That's my enough. oldest is 17, my youngest is 12, and we still sit around the living room and I read out loud to them that's and good. I absolutely love it. And it's all they've ever known. I mean, that's we've always done that. So um, it's great. It is a great way to just build a relationship with your kids. So if you're not doing that, it's not too late. Get some good books and just start reading. Um, it's so, so very simple. Anyway. Um, we are going to get back into this conversation with Adam, but before we do, I want to say thank you again to our sponsor, CTC Math. If you're looking for a great online math program, visit ctcmath.com. Try them out for free. They have a 100% money back guarantee. So if it does not work for your family, they will refund all of their money. They believe so much in their product and we do too. It is a fantastic way to teach math to your kids. Well, for them to teach math to your kids, you don't have to do it because they do it for you. Anyway, visit them at ctcmath.com. Adam, welcome back to the podcast. Good um, to be here. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about how to encourage reluctant re readers because I have had a couple of those, of course, in my home. Um, I, and by a couple, I mean two, and I only have two kids. So <laughs> both of my girls, I think as many kids are in the beginning, are reluctant readers. I have one now who really does not like to read out loud. Like mm -hmm. she, if I, if I said, let's do a read aloud, she's like, no, anything. Can I do dishes? Can I scrub toilets? I will mm -hmm. literally do anything else, but have to read aloud. Um, so I, I would love to talk about that. How can you encourage parents who have those kids who are just like, uh -uh, I don't want to learn to mm -hmm. read, or I don't want to read out loud. Uh, what do we do with those ones? That's a great question. Cause we all struggle with it to one degree or another. I had six kids and they were not all equally enthusiastic about reading either alone or aloud. And we had decided in our family that it was a priority. And it sounds like today we're talking with people who may have already assumed that that is a decent priority to have. Reading is good. Reading aloud is good. Kids should learn to do it and maybe even be made to do it since not every kid knows exactly what's good for him at all times. And so yeah. we're presented with the problem. And one of the things we've always done at Center for Lit, which goes along with our our Socratic method and our use of children's stories to teach the basic elements of fiction and to prepare kids to read adult classics when they grow up is to focus on the use and the benefit that children's books can provide in another way. That is as a easy access, an easy way into confidence in reading. And this is the principle that we've distilled that I share with everyone that I talk to about this. Always Always teach literature with books below reading level. Always, always teach literature with books below reading level. And it doesn't matter how far below. The further below reading level, the better. And the reason for this is that one of the main obstacles we face in reading among reluctant readers is it's too hard. Yeah. It's daunting. It is intimidating for me to try and read that book. I'm not gonna understand it. The words are gonna to be too big. I don't get it. It's too much work. There's too many words on the page, et cetera, and et cetera. 
if we can remove all of those obstacles and just present reading itself in a situation where success is almost assured, then a lot of those uh, barriers are going to start to come down. In a previous episode, we talked about a bargain for Francis. Um, I actually use a bargain for Francis, the picture book about the two badgers that can't get along in classes of every age up to and including adults. And one thing that never sticks as an objection is the reading level of this book is too low. Right. <laughs> that just never, nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says that a bargain for Francis, because it's too easy, uh, can't teach me anything. Nobody ever says at the end of a class on a bargain for Francis, I didn't learn anything because the book was too easy. As a matter of fact, they very often say the opposite. Thank God this book was easy because the, the job of learning how to read literature uh, was clearer and easier for me since I didn't have to struggle through difficult vocabulary and uh, difficult emotional content or whatever. This is true for our kids too. They're actually involved in two separate tasks, learning how books are put together and how to read them well, and right. learning to navigate difficult vocabulary and tough emotional content. We should separate those tasks out and we should teach them how to read with super easy books where they can not fail. And we've taken a lot of, of reluctant readers into a reading life by saying, here's a lesson where you can't fail. It involves yeah. reading and you are going to win. And yeah. we do that by using easy, easy books. Yeah. That's the first thing I would say. Do I have time to say another one? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I just was going to comment on that. I think that's so important because those kids, especially in those early years when they're first learning how to read, they're learning to just dissect the words. And mm -hmm. that in itself is such an effort for them. It takes right. so much out of them. And so earlier, of course, in the week, we talked about asking questions and the importance of that's how we teach good literature, right? But we don't want to ask a four-year-old who's just learning how to dissect a word. Okay, now let's no. ask all the questions about the content of the story. And I want you to give me a narrative on it. Like that's unfair because then right. that kid is going to be completely overwhelmed and they are not going to want to read anymore. And the other thing I've learned with my girls, um, especially with one of them, who's, who's my reluctant read aloud girl, um, is I will read to her. I'll take a, an easy book and I will read a chapter out loud to her with her. I'll just, just the two of us, I'll read it to her. And then I'll say, okay, now I want you to read it back to me because now she's already heard it and she's more confident in her ability to read it. And I find that that has been helpful with her as well. Yeah. What you're essentially doing when you do, you read it for her and then you have her read it after you is you are making out of that text an easy, easy book. Right. You're essentially creating a situation where it's easy. Right. And I think that's what we should go for. We should set mm -hmm. our kids up for success at every turn. Yeah. The other thing we can do is we cannot be so high and mighty about the fact that we have to have the greatest books that have ever been written on the curriculum from beginning to end. And if what they really want to do is read the Hardy Boys, and that's a book that is, is exciting to them and they will read it because they're interested, even though it's kind of vacuous and schlocky. So uh -huh. every once in a while, what we do with our kids sometimes we say, okay, we're going to, we're going to do this together. You pick one and then I'll pick one. Yes. <laughs> we read the Hardy yeah. Boys first, Percy Jackson first or whatever. And then we're going to read the Odyssey after that. Yeah. That actually works pretty well as well. Yeah. Here, I have a really funny story about that. And I, I'm, pretty sure I've probably told this on the podcast in the past, but our um, oldest daughter, when she was just learning how to read, she was in, I don't know, probably second grade um, before she really was comfortable reading chapter books, second or third grade. She could read, but it just scared her and she didn't want to read these chapter books. And so my husband had worked on two of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies and <laughs> she had watched them and they're so dumb. I mean, the movies are, I actually think they're pretty funny, um, but the books themselves are just really, really dumb. Like there's no, <laughs> there's no redeeming value to them whatsoever. But she wanted to read the books because my husband had worked, you know, her daddy had worked on the movies. And so I kept saying, no, 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 no. That's twaddle. You can't read twaddle. We don't read twaddle in this house, right? And so finally my husband said, you know what? She's asking to read a book. You keep telling her to read. She wants to read Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Just let her read them. And they, they actually have chapters, but a chapter in Diary of a Wimpy Kid is like, you know, three or four pages. And there's like two sentences on each page. Well, she read her first one in like two or three days. And she was like, 
I just read a whole chapter book by myself. And she was so proud of herself. Is it? And that was what kind of launched her into reading. Cause it was like, she just needed that confidence to know that she could do it. And exactly then she was fine. Saying. And it was such a funny thing that I'm like, okay, you were right. I was wrong. I should have yeah. let her read it a year ago. Absolutely right. And, and you're uh, to be so concerned about high quality content can sometimes mm -hmm. get in the way sure. of what's the other task that we're involved in, which is to break down the barriers to sitting in front of a book and, and reading it. Right. Right. Which is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's take a break. We'll be right back. We want to thank all of our sponsors for making this show possible. BJU Press Homeschool, CTC Math, Apologia, and IEW. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Visit the show notes for links to these great companies and thank them for supporting the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. We are back with Adam Andrews. Um, Adam, okay, here's, here's what we need to talk about these last few minutes of the podcast because you're talking to a bunch of homeschool moms who are trying to figure out like, how do I grade all of these things, right? Especially when it comes to maybe middle school and high school and we need transcripts for our kids. And how do you grade literature? How do you do a, a, a transcript for a book, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems a little bit complicated. Um, you've done this with six kids already. So talk us through how we can assign literature to our kids and then how do we grade that so that um, it's, it looks good on their transcripts. Yeah, that's good. I like the way you say that. The, uh, the important thing to remember when they're little is that there's nobody's looking for a transcript. And so, um, I think you should not make one. Um, we think that worksheets and written assignments with the, with the exception of a literary essay, uh, are the opposite of the learning process and the education process in literature. Um, Homer did not put the Odyssey together so that everybody would do a vocab quiz afterwards. Uh, he put the Odyssey together so that we could sit around a fire and listen to it and then talk about it. That's what we should be doing with books uh, as long as we possibly can. There are two things that mitigate against that, though, and one of them is we also want to teach our kids how to write because we live in a different culture than Homer did, and everybody needs to know how to write, and literature is one of the things we can use to learn how to write. That needs to be kept separate in our minds from the literature process. And then secondly, of course, when they get into high school, other people outside the family uh, have reasons to want to know what's going on in our literature classes and they want to see written evidence. And so we have to produce some sort of assignment trail. But I'm always, I always want to keep the, the thing distinct in everybody's mind. I mean, if I imagine a kid coming up to me and who's just read Huckleberry Finn and I ask him, how well did you understand it? How well did it actually go down into your heart and soul? How much of Mark Twain's goals actually landed with you? And he looks at me and says, 87. <laughs> Then this is not really an answer that I can use. Right. Uh, and it doesn't, well, maybe I can use it, but it doesn't mean anything. Right. And so what I think we should do when we are go come to making assignments and grading them is to separate out the two processes that we've been talking about, the literary education, which frankly happens in an oral discussion mm -hmm. and the paper trail we need to create for the powers that be. And I think what we can do is make a set of assignments in that paper trail that can be graded based on stuff that is repeatable and is measurable. Like, for instance, did you turn it in on time? Does it have grammatical errors in it? Does it refer to the text in its answer that we can quickly evaluate, make a grade for, and then that paper trail can be true to itself and also not take a bunch of our time. We use the Socratic method for this, actually, the Socratic list uh, that we've developed at Center for Lit, which is available in our basic seminar, Teaching the Classics. It's 172 discussion questions about the structural elements of literature. Each one of those can be a very effective essay prompt. What is the main goal obstacle facing the protagonist in this story and how is it solved? That can be a one sentence assignment for a fifth grader. Mm -hmm. It can be a one paragraph assignment for a sixth grader. It could be a one page assignment for a ninth grader. It can be a one chapter assignment for a grown up. And so the, the same question can be applied to various grade levels and then graded based on the technical aspects of character? Did you apply yourself and turn it in on time? Right. Mechanics, are there capital letters at the beginning of every sentence? And general reference to the text. We think that kind of assignment is really the most effective kind. Now, this leaves to the side the whole question of literary composition, which we have a lot to say about and probably can't discuss it here, but that is kind of a separate, a separate thing. So talk to the mom who maybe she's like, I'm not great at grammar. You're asking me to grade my kid's paper and I don't really know how to do that. You mm -hmm. know, she, that grammar and, and reading and writing is just not her gift. Sure. 
how so would there, how would that mom deal with that? All kinds of resources out there for for grammar. It's in the you know, the phonics and grammar and syntax category. Mm -hmm. Missy and I used IEW Institute mm -hmm. for Excellence in Writing, all coming along, and it's basically a foolproof way to uh, to get your kids to write clean English prose. Um, and so that's what I would recommend: some sort of resource like that. Sure, sure. And also, we could maybe ask a family member, a neighbor, uh, you know, uh -huh. just a good friend, someone who really is good at grammar um, and who loves to maybe proofread papers and say, uh -huh. hey, can you read this for my kid? Um, and yes, um, IEW is fantastic. They're one of our sponsors. You guys, as you're listening, probably heard that ad break right in the middle of this podcast. Um, but they're um, Andrew Poudois is the, the founder of IEW, and they are a fantastic resource for learning and teaching grammar uh, to your kids. And you can do their video-based programs. Um, you could do it yourself if you don't want to use the videos, but but they're great. So um, so Adam, I, I know that you and Missy have a great relationship with IEW and with Andrew Pudua. Um, Talk really quickly about Center for Lit. You have so many great resources um, on your website and through your ministry. Uh, really quickly give us an overview of what you have that can help us as homeschool moms to teach literature well to our kids. Sure. So the main thing we have is a teacher training seminar called Teaching the Classics, which I mentioned a minute ago. And it's basically a uh, a weekend long course in how to apply this Socratic method that we have developed to the teaching of literature. It takes okay. parents and, and teachers who don't necessarily have any experience in that subject at all from the very beginning up to the end and gives them a step by step process by which they can take any book that they have read together with their kids and have a profound discussion about its literary merits with kids of any age. So teaching the classics is the first thing that we offer. We offer it in DVD and, and uh, notebook format and also a streaming version inside okay. our Pelican Society, which is our membership site where all of our resources are gathered together under one roof. And those include not only teaching the classics, but we have a worldview detective seminar, which is uh, sort of a second stage kind of analysis where we talk about worldview ideas with respect to literature. And then a giant library of teacher guides which are uh, basically 10 to 15 page documents that take the Socratic method we've developed and apply it to a particular story, Treasure Island or Shakespeare's Hamlet or mm -hmm. A Bargain for Francis. Choose questions from the Socratic list and then give the teacher uh, scripted answers to each of those questions that are keyed to the text mm -hmm. so that she can brush up on the reading that she should have done before this class and stand up in front of the class very well prepared to conduct the right kind of Socratic discussion. So we've got dozens of these teacher guides inside the Pelican Society. And then okay. one final other resource, and there are many others, but I just want to mention this one, is Reading Roadmaps, mm -hmm. which is an annotated bibliography for K through 12 of the books that Missy and I read with our kids when they were coming along and that we suggest you could uh, you could use with your own Reading Roadmaps. Yeah, awesome. We will link all of those things in the show notes um, so that you guys can, can easily find them. Um, I have one last question for you, and this is this is a big one. Um, what is your favorite book, aside from the Bible? I should say, not aside, in addition to the Bible. Like if you were stranded on an island and you knew you were going to be stranded on an island and you could only take two books with you, the Bible and something else, what would you take? And I'll give you three books if you want me to show you some grace here. Okay, you can give me three because I teach kids of all ages and have had kids of all ages. And so I have book favorites in all age categories. Okay. So start with a picture. My favorite picture book for little ones is All the Places to Love by Patricia McLaughlin, who is also the author of Sarah Plain and Tall and okay. some other great ones. Uh, Oil Paintings by Mike Wimmer uh, make this book for young readers a, just an absolute piece of, of literary art. It's poetry. It's a masterpiece. It deals with universal themes in universal compelling ways. And so by my definition is a classic of the genre, all the places to love. Okay. Jersha McLaughlin. For the young readers, I would say uh, that the best book in the world is Gary D. Schmidt's um, Straw into Gold. Although anything by Gary D. Schmidt, in my view, uh, should be on this list of your favorite books. So okay. basically you say pick one. Straw into Gold uh, is a retelling of the Rumpelstiltskin story with such gracious, gentle attention to the most important things in the world that you will not be sorry you read it. Okay. I've, I've not heard of Gary D. Schmidt before. Um, for grownups, I have to I have to give you two. Uh, okay. The first one is Charles Dickens' Little Dorrit. Okay. 
Dorrit, D-O-R-R-I-T. Okay. Uh, one of his great, most famous Dickensian novels and the best literary depiction of grace that I think I've ever read. Uh, so I recommend it to everyone. Okay. And then finally for adults, something from the 20th century that makes my favorites list is C.S. Lewis, Till We Have Faces. Okay. Um, uh, I've not I heard of that one. Till, yeah, Till We Have Faces is his best novel. Okay. Uh, it's absolutely his best novel. I will accept no other opinion about that. <laughs> um, Lewis only really talked ever about one thing, and this is a novel about that thing. But okay. it, it is Lewis at his very best. Till We Have Faces. Till We Have Faces. Okay. I am not familiar with that one, but I am putting that on my list. And uh, that is one. And are these, are all of these good read alouds um, to read with our kids? Or are these, like Till so, We Have Faces, is that a good like read loud or is that just something that we, we want faces, to fill up? Yeah, it's, it's for grownups for sure. Okay. Um, and it's probably not the best read aloud of all time. Um, okay. Dickens is a wonderful read aloud. Uh, all, anything by Dickens. If you have yeah. a year to read it aloud, uh, it's great. It's 1,042 pages or something oh, like that. Oh, good golly. <laughs> well, it's not that long, but it's it's a good, fat Victorian novel. <laughs> okay. But the other two, the Gary Smith is great for reading aloud. And obviously, my, Patricia McLaughlin was designed to be read aloud. It's, okay. it's just fabulous. Okay, awesome. We will link those in the show notes. Adam, thank you so much for being with us this week. It has been such a pleasure chatting with you and being encouraged in our homeschool journey of literature. Um, it's such an important part of our homeschooling. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for your wisdom this week. We really My appreciate pleasure. it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been fun. And thank you guys so much for listening. Stay tuned to the very end so you can hear a clip of what's coming up next week on the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. And everything we have is at the website, schoolhouserocked.com. If you would like to donate, um, you can click on the donate button there. Um, we're always looking for supporters for this ministry so we can keep doing what we do and what we love to do. We love, love, love what God has called our family to. And we love nothing more than being able to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. And so you can go on and encourage your kids in their walk with the Lord. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you guys back here next week. Bye. A mom said to me one time, aren't you worried about sheltering your children? And I said to her, we care more about sheltering tomato plants in the culture right now than we do about our precious children. And so if someone wants to accuse me of sheltering my children, my answer is always absolutely yes. I will shelter my child until I know my child can stand up against the elements of the culture so that they can grow to maturity. And we slowly begin to remove the shelter from around them as we see that they are mature and that they understand the battle lines around them and can engage the culture from a position of strength rather than weakness. Throughout history, the basic foundation of any economy is its agriculture. Um, it's, I don't believe that God wants everybody to be a farmer. Mm -hmm, right. um, but it's kind of like if you're not faithful with the very first thing God gives you, then you can't expect to build on top of that, you know, mining, manufacturing, industry, trade, art, culture, all those other things, if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you're not really at liberty to do that.